know it's Jesus' plan for us to have life and to have it more abundantly. He would have never said it if he didn't mean it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. John chapter 11. Let's look at verse 11. These things said he, and after he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. And howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had been spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us, go, let us also go that we may die with him. Turn to John chapter 20 now. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands and the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Father God, we thank you tonight, Lord. I thank you for your word, God. Lord, I think the thing that I'm most grateful for after you, that the fact that you've given your life, God, that I might be set free, Father, and forgiven of my sins and have eternal life. Lord, I am so grateful for your faithfulness, God. I am so grateful, God, that you are committed to us more than we've ever committed to you, Father. And Lord, I thank you, God, that you know the whole picture, God. You know the the why behind the what, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, that you never give up on your children, God. But Lord, that you are a man who is acquainted with grief, Father God. Lord, that when we go through things, and sometimes when we don't handle things the way we should handle them, Father, Lord, you never get angry, but God, you just stay right in there with us, always teaching, always leading, and always guiding. Father, I thank you tonight, God, that when we have unbelief, 
that you are there to help our unbelief, Father God. I thank you tonight, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for the process which every child of God must go through. But Lord, I thank you for your patience, Lord, while we go through this process, Father. Lord, while you know the end from the beginning, Father, as we are reading the pages as, as they've been written in our lives, Father God, we don't know sometimes how we're going to get through something or when you're going to come through, Father. But we just thank you, God, that you are always faithful, Father. Lord, I ask you tonight, God, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying. Lord, I come against every distraction, every hindrance in this place right now, Father. Lord, every, every legalistic spirit, God, that would try to destroy and rob this word, Lord God. Father, I ask you to take the shackles, Lord God, and the blinders off disbelief and doubt and fear, Lord God. Father, I ask you, Lord God, that we would just be able, Lord, to just put our Holy Ghost eyeglasses on, God, and be able to see our situation the way you see it, Father. Lord, I just ask you tonight, God, to let your word go forth like seed and let it not return unto you void. But God, let it accomplish that for which you have sent it. Let it save, let it deliver, let it heal, God. Let it bring clarity, Lord God, to where there is confusion, Lord God. Let it bring hope, God, where there is hopelessness, Father. Set the captive free tonight, God. We praise you and we thank you when all God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I am truly excited uh, about this new series called The Lazarus Effect. I believe that it is um, truly a prophetic series because I believe that God is just about to do something so miraculous in our midst. That, And I, and I know that um, for many people, many Christians, um, people are, are, are going through a, a, a season of frustration uh, because you have prayed and believed for things for so long. Um, you've done what is right. You've, you've kept your hand to the plow. You've, you know, none of us are perfect, but you've done your best. Amen. Everybody could always do a little bit better, but, you know, you've, you've just done your best. And sometimes, you know, you just got to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Well, I'm not where I should be or where I want to be, but I'm just grateful today that I'm better. I'm just grateful today that I'm better. I'm just, uh, I'm just grateful today that, that I could see a little bit of ray of hope. I'm, just, I'm, I'm grateful today that I handle the challenges today better than I did yesterday. Amen? And, um, but I believe that God is about to do something. Um, and I encourage you to come out on Tuesday night because I have a, a word already prepared uh, from when it's called when the tomb becomes a womb. So as we get into this last verse, I'm really excited about this, and I love when God just gives me words, you know, ahead of schedule and stuff, and I've just been praying in my spirit. Because um, I do believe that everything that has died in your life, and I know that many of you are experiencing death, death of dreams. You've waited so long for something that you kind of think, well, you know what? I don't think I should be praying for this anymore. I'll just let it go. I guess it wasn't God. And yet, as much as you try to lay it down, you try to bury it, you, you try to ignore it, there's something that's still there, which if it's still there after all you're burying and you're trying to kill it and you're trying to ignore it and you're trying to deny it, if it's still coming up, it's not a weed, okay? It, it's not a weed. It, it's a dream. It's a word. Because when God speaks a word, and this is how you know. See, you know, so many times people in, in our human, we don't like time. We don't like waiting for time. And we think that time is our enemy. But really, God uses time as our friend. Because time is what it takes to, to grow something, to mature something. Amen. Um, in this, in this story, Lazarus, it's, it's an amazing thing that God waits two extra days. Okay, so there's always, there's always a, a, a waiting period. But God says, if that doesn't go away, you have to know that it's him. And if he spoke that word to you, you've got to hold on to it and know that somehow, some way, 
at some point, it's going to happen. Because God will not go back on his word. His word is seed. Okay, so when he planted that seed in you, God does not abort his word. God does not contradict his word. God doesn't say one thing and then do another thing. Even as we read in the story about Lazarus, it appears. It appears that he says this sickness isn't unto death. And then all of a sudden he says that he's dead. But then later on, we read about how he's raised again. Amen. So tonight, I want to talk to you about something that I don't think that's really spoken about a lot, and that's on the subject of doubt. And God gave me the title of this, of this sermon called, Not Unwilling, Just Unable. I'm not unwilling, I'm just unable. See, doubt is something that every single person has encountered in their life. Um, we've, we've all experienced in a crisis that all too familiar question, I know God can do it, but will he do it? Um, most people have experienced times when God has said yes, but we've all experienced in those times where God has said no, or God has said not yet. And because God's ways are so much higher than ours, it can get very, very confusing, especially, like I said, in our text, it looks like God is contradicting his word. Now, we read the whole story, and we know that, you know, in, in these verses, you know, he's sick, and then we know in these verses that he died, and then we also know coming that in these verses, he lives again. But while these people are living out their story, they don't know that there are more verses to come. And sometimes it gets really confusing because we understand that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Our pages have all been written, but every day we wake up and we read the pages as it's happening. Okay, we don't we don't know um, what what exactly is going on. So I know the text doesn't say it, but I can imagine all 12 of these boys looking at Jesus because even Jesus is seeing their confusion. He's saying, you know, it's not unto death. And then he says, well, Lazarus is sleeping. And everybody goes, well, okay, well, that's good. If he's sleeping, then he's just resting. And, you know, when we get there, you know, you'll, you'll heal him. It, it'll be good. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. He's dead. And I can imagine the boys all turning around looking at each other and going, what? Did, no, does dead mean dead or does it have some kind of deeper meaning? Like, we, we don't get it. And there is absolute confusion. Have you ever been confused? Okay. Has God ever told you that you're going to do this and then it dies? And when something's dead, it's dead. It's, that's the time, like, everybody always says to me, when do you stop believing for healing? I said, until the person's dead. And then, you know, you could wait until that embalming process happens. I still pray because I know my God can do anything. God can even, okay, Make an embodied body live, okay? An embalmed body live. Um, but the reason that they're confused is because they couldn't see the whole picture. The Bible says that my ways, God declares that his ways are higher than our ways. Jesus knows the whole picture. And sometimes what happens is we get caught within ourselves at our little piece of the puzzle. But God says, I've got a much bigger plan that involves you, but you're involved in something bigger than just you. So I need you to just don't panic and just hold on and follow me. Now, what I love about this, this, this text is I find that there's a lot of humanity in it, and I feel like there's a lot of everyday life of, of shown in here about what we go through. And, and I, when I started to study this, God pointed out Thomas to me. 
Now, if I say Thomas, even to the person who's never picked up a Bible, they will always put the word doubting Thomas in front of him. Amen? Um, and it's, it's an amazing thing that, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a terrible thing that he doubts one time. And now he's got this, you know what I mean? Like, let it go already. You know, like he's, he's defined, his whole life and his whole character is defined because he's a doubting Thomas. Um, and so we always peg him as being this bad guy, but I kind of want to bring a different, a different light onto him tonight. Because um, I know, listen, many times in our lives, if you were to honestly look at your own life and how many times you've had a battle, you've come against a crisis, you know, you could probably fill your name in there and say, you know, you're doubting Karen or doubting whoever and put your name in there. Because we've all, we've all doubted. However, what I love about this text is that when you really study Thomas, he's really not the doubter that we pegged him to be. Because here in our scripture, you got to look at the way this story plays out. The disciples and Jesus are all together. They get word that Lazarus is sick. Okay? Uh, Jesus says it's not, it's not, the sickness is not unto death. He says, but we'll go into Judea. Um, We'll go, nevertheless, we're going to go see him. Then they find out that he's dead. And then Jesus says, nevertheless, we're still going to go. Now, you need to understand that going to where Lazarus was, they were going into Bethany. They had to go through Judea. And the disciples tell Jesus, Jesus, the last time you went through there, they were planning on stoning you and killing you. But here, Thomas, in our text, he is the only one out of the 12 that turn around and say, nevertheless, let us go. If we die with him, we die. I don't know about you, but when I read this story, that doesn't sound like a doubter to me. Because, I mean, remember, later on, we read the story where Peter is ready. You know, he cuts the ear off of the soldier. You know, Peter is the one at the Last Supper saying, God, you know, I'll never never deny you. I'll be right there with you all the way to the end. Everybody else will fall away. But here's here's this so-called doubter um, saying, I'm going to go with you. Now, Thomas, we really don't know much about him. He's really not spoken about unless it's it's, uh, where he's called a... um, He's called in this chapter, he's also spoken about in, in, at the resurrection. He, they, the Bible says that his name is Thomas, and it says he's from Dynamis. Dynamis, in the Greek word, means twin. Talks about him being a twin. And I have to say that, you know what, I think about all of this, and there's a twin inside each and every one of us. So it was interesting as I was studying this that some of the early church actually think that Matthew was his twin. But they can't prove that, so you can't take that to the bank. But nevertheless, he was actually a twin, and his nickname was Twin. Now, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing because you look at him, and, and here he is. He says, listen, if they kill you, then they're going to have to kill me too. So we see that there is, a, there, is, there is a loyalty there, there is a love, and there is a commitment there. It doesn't sound like somebody who's wishy-washy. I mean, it doesn't sound like Thomas was with Jesus on Monday, and then by Wednesday he was, you know, going off on some other tangent. Thomas was with the Lord. Um, so... When we think about Thomas, I don't think that Thomas was a doubter, but Thomas just did not accept easy answers. John's Gospel mentions Thomas uh, one other time, and that's at the crucifixion. And I read that part of the story. Um, God is saying, listen, don't let your, don't let your hearts be troubled. And, and Thomas, during this whole thing, he's never really spoken about, but he's always there, and he's always quietly listening probably very intently, very carefully. And, and all of this talk, when, when Jesus is talking to him about in John, in John chapter um, 14, Jesus is telling him 
listen, in, in that chapter, I'm going to prepare a place for you. There, there are things coming. There's things that are going to happen to me. But, but where I'm going, you're going to be with me also. And he's sitting there very quietly while Jesus is talking. But, but Thomas is the only one who says, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't, I don't understand this because you say that you're going and, and I'm going to be able to go there with you. But I don't know the way. See, Thomas was one of those people that if he didn't understand something, he spoke up. Thomas was somebody that, listen, I, I want the real thing. I want to understand what I'm believing. Because I'm really committed to this thing. You know, many times people will sit in church and they will accept anything and everything that is said over a pulpit because the pastor said so. And I'll tell you, you need to be very careful, especially in these days and time, because when I just turn on the television, it's amazing at how I hear the gospel of Jesus Christ being distorted. You can hear the message of grace, but sometimes, you know, the message of grace gets greased. And I will tell you that heaven is a prepared place and hell is a prepared place. And you don't get accidentally into either one of those places. You prepare to go to one of those places. You can't live like the devil and then expect, you know, okay, I'll end up going to heaven. That's not grace. Grace enables you not to sin or to keep you from sin. Amen? So Thomas is one of these people that he's like, listen... I know who you are, I believe in you, but I, I want to understand why, because I want to know who you are. And sometimes I think we make the same mistakes in Christianity that we just kind of get settled to just kind of getting into church and doing what we're supposed to do, and we do the bare minimum, but we have no fire. See, sometimes people will come to me and say, listen, I, I don't want to offend you, now, but would you be angry if, you, if I, you said something and I didn't understand it? Can you explain it? And when people come to me like that, I'm always welcoming that because you know what? They're listening. I know when somebody wants to ask, and there's a way to ask a question. There's a way to ask a question. It says, listen, I'm confused about what you said, or you know you said this, and it really should mean that. Do you understand what I'm saying when somebody's attacking you or somebody is genuinely trying to understand? There was no viciousness or unbelief in Thomas's statement here. He's just saying, I don't, wait a minute, I, I don't understand it. And really, probably all 12 didn't understand it. But Thomas had the guts to say, hey, I don't understand. What are you talking about? How am I going to get to this place? And you're telling me I know the way, but I don't know the way. And when he asked the questions, there's something that you need to know about Jesus. Jesus never rebukes him. See, God doesn't get angry when we come to him as we are and we're able to ask the questions. You know, in the Bible it says, it says, come, let us reason. Job was able to sit down and have a conversation with God. Job really didn't question until, the, you know, he was able to do it. Then he was able to have a, con a conversation with God. And sometimes, you know, people don't want to have a, have a conversation with God because they just don't want to go deeper and, and, and have an intimate relationship. Now, listen, I will tell you that sometimes you'll ask God a question, especially if you say why. And there are those things that sometimes God won't let you in on. But yet the Bible does say that if we call on God as deep calls unto deep, he will tell us great and mighty things that we don't know. But, you know, Thomas, he wants this intimate relationship with Christ. So we see that Thomas, he was an independent thinker. He was a thoughtful man. And he wasn't easily um, stampeded. You know, sometimes I think, I think what happens, and I, and I see it a lot in ministry with people who, who want to be elevated. And it's prideful people. That sometimes people are ashamed to say, I don't know. Or 
to ask what they don't know. I see it in pastors' meetings all the time. Many times I'll go to a meeting and, and is there any questions? And everybody gets really silent. What, what are you struggling with? And the moment that one pastor breaks silence and begins to open up their heart, all of a sudden everybody else comes along. And Thomas was somebody that says, listen, I'm in this because I believe in this because I am completely vested in it. So, Lord, I want to know who you are. I want to know exactly what you're talking about. Because, you know, so many times when we witness to people, we're so good at spewing scriptures. But then when somebody turns around and says, well, why do you believe that? Um... Uh, because that's what they told us in church, because we believe it just to believe it. And when you say things like that, you lose credibility. You lose credibility. People think it's not a big deal to know chapter and verse. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is, because you've got to know what you believe, but you've got to know why you believe it. And it's got to go beyond, because that's what the church told me so. You got to know the word. See, the, re the only revelation should not be coming over the pulpit. Revelation should be coming from God to all who read his word. He says, if you seek me, you will find me. And part of seeking somebody is asking, is knocking. God doesn't get upset when his children come to him. In fact, God would rather you come to him and counsel with him than go to man and get the wrong counsel. Because sometimes when people counsel you, they're counseling you out of their negative experience. And God says, I've got a whole different story written for you. Sometimes people will counsel you out of their pain. That's why I love that advice I was given so long ago. Don't buy clothes from a naked man. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. Counsel with somebody who's been there, who's done that, who's not bitter, who's been hurt but come through the other side, that can speak out of love and can speak out of forgiveness and yet give you great wisdom single people do not speak to a, a divorced bitter person you will never ever get married married people even though you've got a great marriage and sometimes you just have those times don't talk about your moments and your times with people that are single because you will flip them out and scare them. That doesn't say, I don't want to be married because all they do is fight. All they do is argue. You know, it's like, it's like when my, my kids would come home and, and they'd have a fight with their friends. I never stepped in the middle and called the other mother. Why? Because the kids tomorrow will make up and be friends and then the two parents never speak to one another ever again. But Thomas is somebody who's saying, hey, I'm independent. Listen, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm following you, I'm giving, and I'm serving, but I want to understand. I want to understand why I'm here and what I'm doing. That God, what you're saying to me, I know is so important. And just because somebody questions something doesn't mean that they doubt the person. When my children ask me, you know, mom, can I have this or can I have that? And I'll say, yeah, you can have it. And they say, when? It's not that they're doubting me, but they're expecting it. So I want to know, when do I expect it? And how soon is soon? Or what's the requirement for it to come? So what Thomas is saying, I'm not going to make a confession of faith unless I deeply believe it's true. Because maybe what he saw was a lot of other people talking the talk but not walking the walk. And Thomas was somebody that was saying, listen, if I'm in this thing, then I am who I say I am. 
So I want to understand this thing from beginning to end. And if you tell me that there are some things that I, I'm on a need-to-know basis, I can even accept that, but let's have a conversation about this. So, you know, we, we see this, this picture of, of Thomas on the eve of the crucifixion of Christ. And, and you know, he's, he's, he's a brave man, intensely loyal, and deeply committed to Jesus. And if he need be, he's ready to lay down his own life and no doubt inclined to look at someone on the dark side of life. He, he's weighing, he's weighing it out. Just like he was with Lazarus. I'm talking about two different episodes, but it's the same character in both. I want to know, I'm, I'm ready to die with you because I believe in you. God, I'm ready to go where you're going to go. And so, thus, here is the stage set for the crisis after the crucifixion. And I love when, I love when, when he says, nevertheless, if I die with you, I die with you. Because Second Timothy 2 and 11, it says, if we die with him, then we will reign with him. So Thomas was understanding something on a deeper level that the other disciples, maybe they weren't able to communicate. But Thomas is not the doubter that we think that he was. Also, Thomas is not the only great man in the Bible who doubted. Look at John the Baptist. First time we hear about John the Baptist, it's when Elizabeth, when Mary comes to, to meet Elizabeth. And, 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 and Elizabeth's baby hadn't kicked. It hadn't moved. But until Mary comes to her, the baby starts kicking again. And John the Baptist is the forerunner. And John the Baptist knows exactly who Jesus is. He comes to the River Jordan. Jesus says, you need to baptize me. John says, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And he says, no, we've got to do this so all righteousness will be. So John the Baptist ex experiences Jesus. John the Baptist is preaching, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then we see in John's story that he's stuck in a cold, dark prison. And he says, is Jesus the one? Or, or do we search for another? So, so doubt, doubt is something that, in, that is in everybody's life. And the best of the best experience it. And I get angry because sometimes what happens in church, because we get so churched and we hear messages about faith. And listen, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And don't think that I'm saying that we should not have faith because that's not what I'm saying. You have to attach your faith with God's word when you want to see something happen. You cannot just sit there and just quote things and not believe things. But I am saying that we go through times in life where our unbelief, where the twin, you know, you've got that strong spiritual side of you that when you go through something that you're this champion, you're so spiritually strong, but in the next breath, you've got your other twin who's shaking, who's scared, who's upset, who's depressed, who's been disappointed. Maybe that twin's been talking to another set of twins over here that's fed some negativity. You know what I'm talking about. You've been in those influences. So everybody has experienced doubt. Now, when we look at the resurrection... Here's the funny thing. You know, it, it's amazing. It's like the woman who committed adultery, she's committing adultery with who? Another man who's married. But we only hear about the adulterous woman. So here Thomas is with all the other disciples. And this is after the resurrection. This, after, this is after Jesus' death. All 12 are hiding out. Peter denies him. I mean, there's, there's drama all over the place. Um, now, they were, all, they were all looking for a kingdom, but none of them were looking for a resurrection. See what I mean? They had a part of the picture. And even though Jesus told them, there's one thing 
when I can tell you something and giving information. And it's another thing to really comprehend it. To be able to understand. And none of them, no matter how Jesus said, listen, I'm, I'm going to die. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And I, you know, it, they couldn't, in the reality, put it all together. So after Jesus dies, the women go to the tomb. And they're baffled. Because they get to the tomb. And the stone is rolled away. And there's clothes there. And they're shaking their head and they're scratching their head and they're going, what is it? Why? Because they're not looking for a resurrection. They were looking for a body. But they weren't looking for a resurrection. They go back to the boys. The boys tell her, you're nuts. You're out of your mind. It's your grief talking. So what happens? Then Peter and John, they go running with her. And they look in. Why? Because they're looking for a body. They're not looking for a resurrection. And even when Jesus shows up and explains, I mean, the angel shows up and explains things, they're still scratching their head. And so, so, they, so Mark 16, it says that the woman, they came to the tomb on Sunday morning. They weren't, this whole story, it's, it's in Mark. And when you read the Gospels, you've got to understand you're getting four points of view. But all four points of view, Matthew, Luke, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all agree nobody was looking for a resurrection. Mark says that even after the angel explained what happened, they fled to the tomb in trembling. They could not figure it out. They were scratching their heads. They were, they were, run, they were running around. They, they were completely, totally confused. Sure, he said, I'll rise again. But what does that mean? And when they were at the tomb of Lazarus, they saw Lazarus rise again. So he was showing them. He was saying, listen, folks, I am the resurrection and the life. But it wasn't happening the way they thought, and they couldn't put two and two together. They couldn't go back to remember the story of Lazarus and said, this was the forerunner of what we're seeing right now. That basically what Jesus was saying, I want you to watch this. I did this for the benefit of everybody around so that when I die, you'll know that I'll be resurrected. But they were never looking for a resurrection. So here we talk about Thomas is the one who doubts. But they were all in doubt. They were all struggling because nobody knew how to make heads or tails out of the whole situation. Now, one thing that amazes me is that when Jesus appears to them, the only disciple that's not there is Thomas. The first time that Jesus shows up, and he says, see my hands, see my feet. Thomas is not there. And you have to ask yourself, why isn't Thomas there? Where is Thomas? The Bible doesn't say why. But after life experience, this is kind of what I've come up with, and this is my opinion. I think that people experience grief in different ways. There are some people that feel comfort in having a lot of people around them so that they can talk, that they can encourage, they feel better when people... And then there are those people that just like to get alone by themselves. It, it's, it's why I so believe that when somebody is sick and they ask for something, that whether you agree with it or not, respect their wishes. I'm somebody, when I'm sick... Can you just pray for me? Pray for me. I don't really need anybody by my, my bedside, especially coming out of surgery and all that. Don't deal well with an, you know, anesthesia. And sometimes there are some burdens, you know, that you just want to bear alone. You don't want to be that vulnerable to people. You don't want people to see you in that way. And so when people say, listen, no visitors, no visitors means no visitors. Not just you. You know, you need to respect that. And I believe that Thomas, Thomas was somebody, I, I, he, he, he's so blown away. 
Because you've got to understand, these 12 men, they left family. They left houses. They left jobs. They left everything to follow Jesus for three years. I mean, they gave up their lives. All their hope was in him. They thought, you know, we're, 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 we're going we're gonna to come into leadership and thy kingdom come. And, and this is a move of God. They saw him heal the sick and raise the dead. They saw all of these miracles. So Thomas was so vested in it. But here, Christ dies. And his mind has been blown. Have you ever experienced a loss that has blown your mind? Where you turn around and you say, what's up? What's up with this? I don't understand it. I want to see the good in this, but I don't see the good in this. I want the pain to stop, but I don't know if it can ever stop because I am just so, I'm so out of my mind right now. I'm so out of my element. And, you know, it, 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 he, it, it, it's how people respond to the tragedy and sorrows in his life. Everything that he had, he had given it to Jesus. His heart is broken. He's not a bad man. His doubt is not a sinful type of doubt. Deep inside, Thomas wants to believe. So you don't put him in the same place as an unbeliever or as a doubter. His heart is completely broken. So if you want to call Thomas a doubter, don't make him to be an unbeliever. A doubter is not an unbeliever. Some have tried to put him in the, in the category with skeptics. But he doesn't belong there either. Thomas is definitely not a skeptic or a rationalist. His doubts come from a devotion to Christ. There is no doubt like the doubt of a broken heart. It's one thing to doubt the virgin birth in a classroom setting. It's another thing to lose someone you love and wonder if there's a God in heaven. Is that a little too real for you? Thomas is not a skeptic. There are two kinds of doubters in the realm of spiritual truth. There are those really hard-hearted, hard-boiled rationalists who say, I don't believe it, and there's nothing that will ever make me believe it. Such people enjoy their doubt, and they talk about it, they laugh about it, and they get angry when they're refuted. A person that is not looking for answers he is looking for an argument. He counts the difficulty. He sees his objections. He looks for loopholes. The Pharisees are one who fall into that category. Do you understand what I'm saying with that? There, there, is that, there is that type of doubter that, you know what, they just believe what they believe, and they don't want to hear anything else. That's somebody who is an unbeliever. That's somebody who doubts. His doubt is from a broken heart. His doubt is from the type of person who says, I don't believe, but I'm willing to believe if I can see it for myself. Thomas fits the category, he is not an unbelieving skeptic. He is a wounded believer. Remember that Thomas didn't, didn't doubt the mirac miraculous in general. He had seen Jesus do these great miracles. But this one was too big to take someone else's word for. He had to see it for himself. And honestly and truly, who could blame him? And this is why God wanted me to preach this. Because sometimes, sometimes we, there, there's not enough balance in the church today. You've got your faith people on this side of the pendulum and and then you know if you don't have faith then you've got the the judgment and all this in on this side and there's never there's never a balance so if something doesn't work out and listen and and I've seen it done if something doesn't work out it's because you didn't have enough faith I tell the story all the time because it just it impressed me I'll never forget um, 
I was going to a particular church, and they had they had a teacher there, and he was a very very strong um, faith believer. He, his thing was kind of like the name it, claim it, and frame it. If you if you can you know see it, you can believe it. If you can read it, then you've got to believe it. And this woman and her husband had gone to his classes. And, and he got, the husband got very sick, and she believed, and she believed, and, and she prayed the prayer of faith, and, and, and her husband died. And I'll never forget, she came here one of the first weeks that I was, I was teaching here over nine years ago. And she says, I don't understand, Karen. I don't understand what happened. I went to that class, and I did everything that teacher told me to do, and my husband still died. Because here's the thing, there is faith, but there's also the sovereignty of God. There's a time to be born, there's a time to be die. None of us are promised tomorrow. That's why every day is a gift. Every day is a gift. Be grateful, and, and God is always deserving of all the glory, honor, and praise, no matter what is happening. And sometimes, you know, I understand that God has given us all power and authority, but if we're praying faith over something that's not God's will, we shouldn't put our faith in it. It's not faith, it's presumption. And Thomas is just at that place that his mind is blown. You know, I remember I was never really brought up learning about process I never really learned in Sunday school about the plan of God for my life. When I, when I first got saved, all I ever heard was, you get saved, you serve, and you go to heaven. And that's what I did. And, if you, and I was always taught that if you pray and you believe, everything's going to work out. And when I suffered the loss of my brother and my father in three years... I got to tell you, I was in the place of Thomas. And I'm not ashamed to say it. It, 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 was, it was, when I lost my father, it, it was such a devastating blow to me. It was something that changed my life. Like Jacob, I will forever walk with a limp. I'm wounded, but I'm still walking. And... And I remember it just blew my mind because I remember talking to my pastor friend. I said, I don't, un I don't understand. I, I believed and I prayed. I believed, I prayed. I, I, I knew that I knew God was going to heal, but it didn't happen. What, what's up with this? And it, was, and it was in that place that God really started to teach me about faith moving to trust. And, and, and my pastor friend, he said to me, he goes, but Karen, if it be in God's will. But I got to tell you something. That answer didn't satisfy me. I went from a lot, and it wasn't that I didn't love the Lord. I knew God even before I got saved. There was something that always just, I know it sounds crazy, but something that just always drew me to God. Like I've always always had this awareness of God's presence in my life. I didn't know about beings. I mean, when I got saved, okay, now it, now it just had a title, but I felt like I knew God my whole life. I, I prayed before I even knew how to pray. In, 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 in Catholic school, you know, in catechism, they teach you the Alpha, the Hail Mary. You know, I, I never prayed like that. I always had conversations with God. It was just, it was just how me and God rolled. And I, I was literally blown away that I was more shocked that God didn't do something than if he would have done it. And it, it, it blew my mind. And this is the place that Thomas is in. Because Thomas has been with him all of this time. And he's saying, I want to believe. I want to be okay with this. But I am just, I'm not unwilling. I am just unable right now to see, you know, to see clarity. I am, I, I'm, I'm just blown away right now. I can't do it. And what happens in Christianity today, because we have a bunch of people who don't understand grace, and it's all about, you know, I'm going to go to a funeral, and I'm going to jump and shout because it's, it's, it's graduation day and hallelujah and have this big old rock concert. 
Meanwhile, you've got the family over here that lost a mom, that lost a dad, that lost a child, that they're devastated. And they're not, not good Christians or not faith-believing Christians because doctors said, you know, you had six months to live and then you die today in less than a week's time. You didn't even get to say goodbye. There's so many emotions, so many things going on. Thomas loved Jesus. Thomas, when he was walking with him, he was the only disciple to turn around and say, I don't care what they're going to do. Jesus, if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. There was love and devotion. Have you ever been there? God, it's not that I'm not willing. I'm just unable I'm just I can't what, what's the expression I can't see the forest from the trees or whatever I, I just can't I, I don't have that I don't have that clarity I, I want to do it like Paul I mean even Paul said the things that I don't want to do I do what I want to do I don't do you know like I'm willing I'm willing I'm just unable right now and somehow in Christianity, because we've become a bunch of control freaks and these super spiritual I'll call you stupid giants who have no, no touch with reality. You know, remember, when Jesus is with Lazarus, and when, when Lazarus is dead and Martha and Mary there, it says Jesus wept. He wasn't just weeping because everybody wasn't believing. He was weeping because he was seeing people that he loved grieving and mourning. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. He carried our grief and our sorrows. This is where the word of God becomes a rhema in our lives. That God doesn't get upset when we don't understand. But you see, when we call on him, he will tell us things that we need to know. His arm is strong to save you out of that stuff. But sometimes Christianity, the church, the establishment will put on you, well, you don't have enough faith. You don't have the word of God in you. And I want to tell you, Jesus' attitude is, listen, I know this is hard. If God didn't know that it was hard, why would he put it in the Old Testament and let everybody give a heads up? Listen, my ways are not your ways. I know this is not going to be easy. Why do you think he says, listen, I need you to trust in the Lord? And not lean to your own understanding. Because, honey, if you lean to your own understanding, it's going to blow your mind. It will wreck you because you can't understand what I'm doing. He told us these things because he loved us. It's just, again, we're in this human shell and we can't comprehend the reality of what he's saying. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. But when you don't have the picture and all you have are the words. If I told everybody to close their eyes right now and, it's, and imagine, you know, there's a man walking and he's got a red hat and a blue scarf. You know, you, you, everybody's going to see something different. Some people will see a black man. Some people see a Spanish man. Some people see a white man. Some people will see a, 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 a teenager or a young boy. Everybody's going to have a different idea until they see the picture. And when God speaks something, we will often see it the way we want to see it. Or we'll see the finished picture that God shows us, but we don't know how we get there. And that's why God says, listen, you got to hold on because it's going to be a bumpy ride. There's going to be trials and tribulations. There's going to be some difficult times. There's going to be some sad times. There's going to be some scary times. You know, it's not a bed of roses walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But the bottom line is you don't have to fear evil. Why? Because I'm with you. And my rod and my staff are going to bring you comfort because they're going to lead you and guide you in the ways that you need to go. But I'm here to tell you that when your heart is broken like Thomas, he's not unwilling. He is just unable at this point in his time to believe unless he sees it for himself. And you know, God says it in the Old Testament when he's talking about David. He said, I, I don't look at the outer appearance. I look at the inside of the heart. 
You know, that's why sometimes, do you ever see people getting blessed that you're just like, what is up with that? Because you know they're not living right. You know they're not acting right. You know they're not, but God, but God seems to be, to be blessing them. I believe that God, well, every one of us are at a different stage in our process. And each and every one of us are his child. And just like if you have multiple children, you have to speak and discipline each child differently. Because you, they can be all in the same house and hear the same thing, be given the same opportunity, but every one of them is completely different. Sometimes I look at my three children and I'm like, who did y'all come from? Because they're so uniquely different. Yes, there are things that are the same, but they're so different in who they are. And I as a parent, my husband as a parent, we have to look at them and understand you know what? This one we can't do this with because this won't work. But this one we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And God is the same way. Where do you think that understanding and that knowledge comes from? And what I love about this story is that Jesus, when Thomas is finally, you know, he's there. And Thomas is finally with the 12 disciples and Jesus reappears to them. And Jesus doesn't walk over to Thomas and say, is this enough? I'm here. Where were you the first time? He doesn't condemn him. He doesn't come against him. He just looks. He says, come on, Thomas. I know you need this. Touch him. Touch my hands. Touch my side. And Thomas looks at him and he says, my Lord and my God. But Jesus is so compassionate. He's not angry with Thomas because Thomas didn't get it. Because he understands that Thomas truly loves, but just doesn't understand. You know, there's sometimes in our life where you're like, I know what the truth is. I know the answers. I'm just not there yet. Anybody ever been there? And, and people around you can become impatient, and I promise you that they will. Because, listen, and here's the reality of the thing. When you've been through something, you know, when, when you've already been through a course and you got an A on the subject and passed the test and all that, you know, it's very easy that you forget the stress and how hard the subject was in learning it, that when you go back to somebody and you're trying to teach them what you walked through, you're like, what's wrong with you? Come on, get it, get it, get it. But you forget that you didn't get it, get it, get it. But that's okay because you know what? And this is what I'm learning in my walk with the Lord, that sometimes God's not going to allow a bunch of people around you to be able to identify with you and coddle you and love you because God really wants you to himself. That's the power of rejection. That you think that people have rejected you, there's some wrong, and God's saying it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the fact that I want to bring you closer to me because I'm desiring you. That's why I always say rejection, cut off that R-E, and you are ejected into purpose. It's an amazing thing. Jesus knows what you need. And that's why it's so important. You know, nobody likes to be vulnerable. Nobody likes to be, you know, open. And nobody likes to be, you know, stand before God completely naked. But God already knows. He already knows the bad stuff. He already knows every thought you think. There, there is nothing that you can hide from God. And that's why Jesus says, if you would just come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, leave your pride at the door. Leave all of it. 
just tell me what's wrong. Just tell me what's wrong. Just, you know, get into that prayer closet and just weep before him. Don't be afraid. You know, sometimes people are afraid, I think, because they think that God will think that they're an idiot or that God will get mad because they don't understand or because, you know, because people put on us that we should be a lot further along in Christianity than we are. I guess nobody's ever experienced that one. Okay. It's okay. You get there when you get there. There's, there's no race in the process. There is an appointed time. And you're going to learn things as you learn them, as you need to learn them. But the thing you need to remember is to keep going to God and being genuine in your heart. Yeah, Thomas doubted. Everybody's doubted. And I tell you, I, I never looked at the story this way. I never looked at Thomas that way. But his name just jumped off. And he's a twin. And sometimes, you know, we've got a twin going on. And sometimes you need to tell your other twin, you need to be quiet. God's not talking to you right now. And, you know, somehow, listen, and here's the thing about faith. Everybody's been given a measure of faith. Okay? Everybody's been given a measure of faith. Now, depending on what your measure is or how you've exercised your, your faith, because I always say faith is a muscle, and if you want to get muscles, you've got to learn how to work out. Okay? But if you're weak, Jesus is never angry when you come to him and you say, I need you to help my unbelief. I need you to help me believe. See, sometimes I think we think that the believing is just up to us, that it's a force and an act of our will. But you can't do it within yourself. The Bible says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So when you come to God and say, Jesus... My heart's broken right now. Because you know what? I've asked for this healing time and time and time again. God, it's been so many years. And I still have not seen this vision come to pass. God, every single day, my son, my daughter just gets worse. And the situation just seems more hopeless. God, I want to believe you. I'm just at a place right now that it is so hard because my heart is so broken and I'm so devastated that I can't see the forest from the trees. Uh, you, there, there's something you need to do to just jumpstart me. Listen, while I was going through this whole thing for a whole year, didn't tell anybody what was going on with me physically. Many a Tuesday night, before I stepped onto this pulpit, I would say, Lord, you got to give me a ride. You... you you, you got to help me because I can't do this in my own strength. And I would, I, I would battle. I would battle. Every, every day it was a battle. Nobody will ever know what my prayer closet was like the past year. And sometimes, you know, I would have these breakdowns that I couldn't have in front of everybody else. Because what do you do when your pastor wants to jump off a roof? What do you do when you're so scared and you, you got people around, everybody's looking at you and, and you don't want to disappoint and you don't want to scare anybody? You go to God. And I'm the preacher and I'm the pastor and I didn't get any demerits. I didn't lose my gift. In fact, God said, because you came to me and you were honest, I'll give you grace. Like the wings of an eagle, I'll just get right underneath you. And I will carry you through this thing. See, Thomas, he might have doubted, but he wasn't full of pride. Because he would say, I don't understand. Go over that again. Would you say, Jesus, I don't get it. 
I don't get it. Say it again. What? How are we going? How are we going to know this? Because I don't know the way there. Jesus never gets mad at those kind of questions. Jesus never gets angry when you come to him and say, I can't do this. I need help. And you know what happens when you go to God and you ask him for help? He gives it to you. All of a sudden, you'll get a supernatural strength. You, it's some, something from somewhere. I'll tell you, this past year, I've had like an out-of-body experience. It's been amazing. Because there were times where I was like, I, was like I, I just didn't know what I was thinking and what I was feeling. I mean, because half the time I felt like so strong and in my faith. And other times I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get, what am, I go, what am I going through? And nobody's any different from any other person in this place. And I really do believe that the Lord had me preach this message because I think some of you are really struggling under condemnation because somebody told you you don't have enough faith and that's why you're in this position. I want to tell you, okay, maybe you don't have enough faith, but God gave you a measure of faith. So you have some faith, okay? That's what scripture says. The Bible says that. So it's not that you don't have any faith. It's just that maybe you don't know how to work your faith. Maybe your faith right now is being clouded. And God wants you to know tonight, he's not angry with you. And he's not holding you in this place and going to keep you in this place until you get some faith. That's not the way God works. That's not his MO. God wants you to know tonight that wherever you lack, he's the supply. That he will send his spirit to go to that place and supply your every need. That if you need that faith and you need to exercise that muscle, God will get underneath you and he will move your arm. He'll exercise that. But when you can't move your arm for you, you ever see somebody who's sick in bed when they're on dialysis or something and they're kind of in a coma and the nurses come and they, they do their exercises for them? That's what God will do for you. No difference. No difference. Let's prepare for communion tonight. He loves you tonight. The one promise that I hold on to every day in my life, he'll never leave me and he'll never forsake me. No matter what I go through, no matter what I'm feeling, God is committed to me. God is committed to you. You are his child. That word that he has spoken over you, that word, you can hand it out, the word that he's placed within you, it's going to come to pass. And if you're trying to believe and you're trying to be strong on your own, and even though the world and everybody who sees you, they think that you're this pillar of strength, but you yourself, you know you're falling apart, you're in a good place. That's why you just need to go to Jesus and you need to lay it on the line and saying, Lord, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. God, I'm not unwilling. I'm just unable right now. I'm unable in my own strength to believe. I'm unable in my own strength to obey. I'm, I'm unable to forgive that person who hurt me. I'm unable to fight this thing on my own. I'm, un, I'm unable right now not to be in a place of fear because I don't understand. And when God hears these words and he knows that you're not unwilling and knows that you're just unable and you ask him for help, he will swoop down just like the father eagle when he throws that, when he has the baby eaglet on his back, 
and he goes off the cliff and and he's flying and flying the eagle is on his back daddy eagle will just drop underneath him and the little baby eaglet is flipping out where'd you go daddy where'd you go where'd you go i'm gonna fall i'm gonna fall i'm gonna fall but the eaglet cannot fall faster than the father can fly and there is never anything ever recorded in history that the baby eaglet dies because it hit the ground because the because the the eaglet the father eagle wasn't there to carry him you cannot fall faster than your father can fly tonight there is nothing that you can go through that God cannot handle and will not handle God says I just want you to put your trust in me hallelujah mm-hmm. and it flows to the lowest valley oh the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows through the lowest valley That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you tonight. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your grace. For your grace is sufficient, Father. Lord, we thank you, God, that you are the resurrection and the life, Lord. And anybody who believes in you, though he were dead, yet shall he live, Father. I thank you, God, that you are the God of the impossible tonight, Father. Lord, I thank thank you that you gave your life, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I thank you, Father, that the blood that you shed on Calvary, it will never lose its power. Tonight, right now, God, we just plead the blood from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet, Lord God. Lord, we apply it to our minds, Lord God, that you would just deliver us from stinking thinking, Father God. Lord, that you would give us holy perspective, God, and holy perception, Father, on what we're going through right now, God. That we know, Father, that nothing is too hard for you, God. Nothing at all, Father God. With you, all things are possible, Father. I thank you tonight, God, that you've made a way where there was no way. I thank you, Father, and I call forth every Lazarus in this place, Lord God every dead dream Lord God every dead desire every hope and every dream Lord God even sickness in this place even loss of finances Lord everything that the adult the devil has stolen Father God we are calling it back we are calling it forth Father God we thank you Father God right now Father we praise you and we thank you Lord for your resurrection power Father hallelujah we bless your name let's take the bread in our hands For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Let's take the cup in our hand. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Father God, we thank you tonight, God. We thank you, Lord, that the blood will never lose its power, Father. We thank you, Lord, that when the blood was applied, Father God, that we were made safe and protected, Father God. That provision was made, Father. We praise you and we thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen and amen. Are you glad you came out to Sunday service? Amen. Hallelujah. If you have your praise reports, your prayer requests, and your offering tonight, Kathy's going to be by to take that.